I'm Colin Moylan, I'm in Dublin and I'm in the stream and I think it's worth remembering that the uh, Good Friday Agreement has been a very hard won peace and uh, taking down the border posts uh, has been a core part of this in terms of economic trade and cross-border relations. Now, I have a feeling when people were voting for Brexit in mainland Britain, uh, they neither thought about or cared for the implications that might happen on this island as a result of their decision. Column's concerns are why we're doing this show on Northern Ireland today. Peace in the British province is just 20 years old. A stability won in part by the North's economic integration with its Irish Republic neighbour. So what will happen when Britain exits the European Union? That's what people on both sides of the border are wondering. I'm Femi OK. And I'm Malika Bilal and here in the stream. Let's set the scene for you with help from AJ+. We couldn't survive only for the subsidies. There's no way we could survive. 70% of my income is out of it. You know a lot of things like that the borders back up, the police will be back out stopping and just all stuff like that. I've never witnessed it and I wouldn't like to witness it from what you heard years ago, you know. At the end of the day, before the UK market ever went into the EU, they were always a very strong economy, so they were always well able to survive. So they have an identity of their own. Well, Northern Ireland is already a bit more divided this month than last. That's because its power-sharing government has collapsed. As voters go to the polls Thursday to choose a new assembly, Brexit looms. With us to talk about this, in Derry, Northern Ireland, Stephen Kelly, CEO of Manufacturing Northern Ireland, working to improve business environments for member companies. In Belfast, Northern Ireland, Sophie Long is the Director of Communications for the Progressive Unionist Party. South of the border, in Donegal Island, Pierce Doherty is the finance spokesperson for Sinn Féin and a government representative for Donegal South West. And in Newcastle, England, Colin Murray, senior lecturer in law at Newcastle University. Hello, welcome everybody. Pierce, guess, this feels like a very strange time we're in right now. Who would have thought that in 2017, Northern Ireland and Ireland are talking about borders? Pierce, what's the atmosphere like? Yeah, the atmosphere is uh, is is very heightened. Um, people are seeing, as you've seen in the clip there, the young people who were never familiar with the borders of the past, uh, whether there was when what was when there was customs unions before our entry to the European Union, uh, both the Republic of Ireland and the UK, or the type of military borders that we had before the peace process, and people are very concerned at the idea uh, that you would have checkpoints uh, at the border again in relation to customs and. Look, it's not just uh, people on the north that are concerned about this year. I represent a, a community, a county on the south of Ireland, in the Republic of Ireland, uh, and we know that our economic, uh, the impacts of, uh, of Brexit will be absolutely stark. There is nobody that has pointed out a positive to Brexit uh, for the community of Donegal or for communities right across the border. Uh, and people just don't know what to do at this point in time. Businesses don't know whether to invest. Uh, people who want to create jobs are holding back because they're not sure where their future lies. Farmers, as you heard in that clip, 87% of the average farm income in the north of Ireland comes from EU state, uh, state grants, state subsidies. Uh, so therefore, that's going to be gone. What's going to replace it? People are, you know, questioning, you know, will the livelihood that I practice for the last, you know, handed down from generation to generation, will that be now gone yeah. uh, from my, you know, family? And how will I put my kids to college? There, yes, the, so, the real concern. So many questions. Are. So many, so many questions, and not that many answers. Malika, what are you seeing? Uh, just that really summed up here in this tweet. This is from Stephen Andrews, who says, some people are saying that a hard border will bring back violence. My question is, Stephen asks, who is going to cause that violence? Uh, Stephen, uh, I'm gonna direct this tweet to you. This person's name is also Stephen, but we've also seen tweets that he's referencing saying they're concerned that violence might erupt. Is that something that concerns you and where would that be coming from? 
Well, uh, sadly, I'm old enough to remember uh, the troubles as they were known at the time. Uh, thankfully, we've moved well beyond that. Uh, we had a peace settlement here in, in 1998. Uh, institutions created and formed and agreements found that uh, people can work out how to live and work uh, and do politics together. Uh, what we don't need is any return to any of the conditions that would allow that sort of fear and that sort of violence to return. I think that, uh, that there may be some conversation about it, but I think the reality is that whilst there are some people who are wedded to the, uh, those ideals of the past, the vast, vast majority of people, whether they're in the north of Ireland or whether they're in the south, just don't want to see any return to that. Uh, they're a small group of people, and hopefully uh, we can build a community together that means that they don't have any opportunity to, to create any future problems. Stephen, I don't want to bring up some bad memories, but we do have younger people watching this show who don't remember that period between the 1960s and then th three decades it took for there to be some serious resolution of the troubles in Northern Ireland and Ireland. Let me just take you back there with a little piece from Al Jazeera so our younger viewers know what we're talking about. Have a look. The modern history of Northern Ireland has been dominated by one thing the Troubles. A violent, bitter conflict, both political and religious, between those claiming to represent the predominantly Catholic nationalists and those claiming to represent the mainly Protestant unionists. Broadly speaking, the nationalists, also called Republicans, want Northern Ireland to be unified with the Republic of Ireland, while the unionists wanted to remain part of the United Kingdom, along with England, Wales and Scotland. Even that old-fashioned voiceover gives me chills, Sophie. Uh, what are you making of the campaigning that's going on right now? Let me show you something here on my laptop. Border communities against Brexit hold a protest and stage an old-style customs post-border crossing between Newry and Dundalk. Let me just play a little bit to you. Uh you, you you come through here often? I do, every day, yeah. Uh, yeah. Do yeah. well, you think this hard bother would be a, a hindrance to you? Or be a nightmare, so... Well, well, I well this is the way it's going to be if if the hard bother comes back. We're only here to demonstrate what it was years ago. And this is the this is the way it was years ago. And if the hard bother comes back, this is the way it will be. And they'll be holding everyone up for hours. And everyone will have to have a passport with them. OK, I'll remember my next time then. So you remember yeah. the next time to have your passport with you. OK, thank you. OK. Bye. Bye. The driver sounds a little bit confused there, Sophie, but in terms of the campaigning that's going on right now, is there a clear sense of what people want in Northern Ireland? Definitely for the Brexit vote or the Remain Brexit vote that happened, 56% uh, of Northern Ireland said we, we want to stay in the European Union. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Northern Ireland clearly benefited from um, EU peace funding in particular, but also from having Europe as a back uh, backdrop to um, establishing institutions of the Good Friday Agreement. It was much easier to communicate between the UK and the Republic, given mm -hmm. they were both member states. Um, the campaign that's gone on in terms of those, those communities alongside the border, if you want to find a solution to a problem, you should ask the people who know that problem best and um, those people alongside the border are experts in that area and experts in their own lives and experts in that type of movement. Their concerns do need to be listened to and they absolutely have the right to protest. You know, that's, that's a cornerstone of democracy. I really do hope that the Conservative government listen to their voices um, and don't dismiss them um, because um, their concerns are real, their concerns are valid. Um, I'm, I would agree with the, the guy who tweeted in about the threats about violence. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, violence doesn't come from nowhere. People have to enact violence. Um, the main paramilitary organisations are on ceasefire. Um, the, po the political groups who represent them are contesting elections. Therefore, we would hope that they remain wedded to those principles of advancing their means, uh, their aims non-violently. Uh, so such threats do need to be critically examined. Mm. You know, Sophie, you mentioned several key things there. And I, I want to pick up on the Good Friday Agreement because uh, that's something we got a video comment <coughs> in on. And that is the agreement that uh, effectively ended the troubles as they were known. This is a comment we got from Peter Gagan, a University of West of Scotland lecturer. And he worries that Brexit could put into question the gains that came from that agreement. Have a listen to what he told us. The Good Friday Agreement is a historic moment in the history of Ireland and the United Kingdom. 
for the first time, people living in Northern Ireland had a choice. They could be British, they could be Irish, or they could be both if they wanted. And now, almost 20 years on, Brexit calls into question some of the things we've gained from the Good Friday Agreement. The spirit of accommodation, the respect for diversity, the listening to minorities. And now, as Britain prepares to exit the European Union, something which the majority in Northern Ireland voted against, there's a real need to listen and to learn from what the Good Friday Agreement taught us about respecting others and their, their views and their differences. Colin, do you think people are listening and learning to the, you know, the, 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 the consequences and, and what came out of the Good Friday Agreement? Well, I think Peter Gagan's got a great point there, that effectively the Good Friday Agreement happened against a backdrop of both the UK and Ireland being in the European Union. And what that did was dilute the sovereignty that both of those states had. So, if you like, it became a binary distinction, a hard divide between the UK and Ireland. In fact, there was lots that became shared between them from, UK, or from EU membership. Now, what that meant was that the Good Friday Agreement happening in that context diluted some of the hard nationalism that was at the centre of the conflict in Northern Ireland. And against that backdrop, the EU provided, as Sophie said, quite considerable funding to back up peace in Northern Ireland, so provided stability that the executive in Northern Ireland needs to be able to fund programmes that help everyone's day-to-day -day lives. But at a more prosaic level, 30,000 people cross the border day to day to work. Those people have benefited from EU law when it comes to data roaming on their phones and being able to move across the border freely without incurring extra costs in that regard. And all of those things, all of the small things about life just being easier when there is no border between these two states that's actually hard or that has a physical manifestation at all, all comes under threat with leaving the European Union. Sophie, what were you about to say? Go ahead. I, I agree with all of that, and those are kind of uh, practical, everyday, economic uh, benefits which we have for, from, from being in Europe. Um, the other thing I'd point to would be the kind of psychological uncertainty which might come from uh, residents in Northern Ireland who identify as Irish suddenly being cut off now by a newly hardened, possibly militarised, manned border. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's one thing for, uh, you know, British Unionists in Northern Ireland to feel cut off from the mainland, um, but it'll be another thing in, again whenever those divisions are made uh, visceral, made more real, um, by a border which, which hasn't been there in, in many, many years, and it's no longer easy to kind of travel your way around Ireland and, and partition, it, it will basically, it'll solidify partition, and it'll solidify it um, physically, but also in people's minds, when, mm -hmm. that, when that's something that we need to be uh, kind of downplaying, because we're still working to kind of combat things like sectarian, sectarian division, uh, nationalist difference, uh, ethno-sectarian voting, um, and it's, it's really, it's come at a very, very bad time for Northern Ireland. Yeah, uh, Stephen, go, go ahead. Yeah, I, I actually live on the border. I, actually, where my home is, is between what would have been the old military uh, hard border that was here during the, the troubles that we had, and pre-1992, the, the customs border on the on the actual physical frontier between the Republic of Ireland and, and Northern Ireland. And the border has a massive psychological impact on people that live right across it, whether they're in the northern side or indeed on the southern side. And what we have at the moment is that there's over 300 different crossings completely open. Uh, through those crossings, we've got 1.8 million cars traveling every week of 177,000 lorries. Uh, we have 220,000 commuters traveling across that border every single week. And anything that would put a barrier in that way will have a massive and profound effect and Stephen, both on just the by, psychology of people living here, but also the economy. Sure. And Stephen, just by way of an example, 300 crossings now, at the heart of the troubles, there were 20. Uh, exactly. Because and of security so issues. Yeah, and, and even here in, in Derry, my own city, there were essentially just three crossings between mm -hmm. Derry and its natural hinterland in terms of Donegal in the, in the Republic of Ireland. Right now, there's 37. So if we, if we take that example and we bring that right across the, the 350 kilometres or whatever distance that border is, you can begin to see what a disruption this potentially can have to people's lives and to the economy as well.
You know, I'm glad, I'm glad you said that. And Pierce, I, I see you trying to get in there, so I'm going to direct this to you. Um, but I'm glad you mentioned that, Stephen, uh, you know, the effect on people's lives, because this is what Kev just tweeted us. The Irish border was a non-issue for mainland voters, but is potentially one of the most troubling issues. So then, if, if this is true, you would expect, people online are telling us, to uh, have political leaders make sure that this is something that's addressed. Unfortunately, this is the... Uh, sentiment we're getting from people. This is Dale on Twitter who says, political instability right now is hampering Northern Ireland's involvement in any negotiations as the UK withdraws from the EU. So uh, Pierce, I know we're going to see elections happen not too far along uh, from now, this week indeed. So do you think this is true, Dale's point, that with the instability, the elections and what may or may not happen off of the back of them, that's really calling into question these negotiations with the UK? No, well, first of all, uh, the Assembly and the parties represented in the Assembly will not be part of the <coughs> negotiations. The negotiations will take place between uh, the British government and the other member states of the European Union. Uh, and the big challenge in the Assembly, and this is very different from, for example, in Scotland, where they are looking to stay within the European Union also, is that uh, in, in the Assembly, the two parties that were in the government had diametrically uh, opposite, opposite positions in relation to Brexit. Uh, Sinn Féin are very, very clear. We campaigned uh, to remain within the European Union. We have a strong proposal uh, that special status Piers, should be designated let, for let, the north of Ireland. Piers, let me just, let me just, show, let me just yeah. show people this. Uh, it's your page here. It, it tells, tells people who you represent. And under here, Building a new republic, is this an opportunity for Sinn Féin to finally get the kind of island that they want? Is this, is this good for you as a party? Well, well, first of all, no, it's not, it's not good for us because we represent communities. And as I said, uh, I, I don't see any positive that can come from Brexit. I, mm. can, I can only see negatives. Uh, I can see people trying to prey on this to bring us back to, uh, to a position of violence, which is unjustified in, mm. in the current uh, circumstances. Uh, I can see communities really, really under pressure. I can see individuals who won't have the benefits of being able to, what for are example, your get health services. What are your constituents concerned about? I know they've been talking to you. Well, look, for example, it's one third of our, uh, the students in Donegal go to universities uh, or colleges in, uh, in, in the north of Ireland. Uh, after Brexit, they will be treated as international students, which means their fees would quadruple from about £2,500 up to sure. £10,000, which means that families in Donegal would not be able to send their children to university or college in, in the north, and vice versa. The same will happen for students in Derry and Strabane who will go to Letterkenny, which is just a couple of miles, uh, kilometres down the road. So that's a, just a practical issue. There's other people who get health care in, in the north of uh, Ireland, and they do that because that is the, the, the European rules. Any mm. person within the European Union can get health care in another member state free of charge paid by the member state of which they are a member of. Yeah. That will no longer be available. But one of the big concerns here is the actual physical manifestation of the border. And it was mentioned there by Stephen. At a time when the conflict was in full force, and at that time, uh, the, the British authorities with the might of the British Army still couldn't police the border. Um, but what they did was, that, you know, border roads were closed. There was big boulders uh, put in the middle of these roads. Some of them were, you know, blown up craters in the middle of them. Uh, and it was only during the peace process that those roads, roads were reopened. So there are fears of what's going to happen to all this little, the, those little lanes that connect farmlands, mm -hmm. that connect north and south. At the minute, we know that the Irish authorities are starting to identify locations across the border mm -hmm. uh, for customs posts. Uh, so, but w what we do know is that they will not be able to put up 300 custom posts. So they're real, real challenges. And if there is any border roads closed or physical manifestations of a border on the island of Ireland, that type of hard border, there's no doubt about it. That is a red rag yeah. uh, to, to, to Irish people who believe that our, our country should not be per partitioned in the first place. Sophie? Can I, can I maybe come back in? Uh, Stephen. Uh, Stephen and then Sophie. Yeah, uh, uh, just to say, I mean, it, it doesn't matter if the border uh, is on the island of Ireland or even if there's a border uh, in the Irish Sea between uh, the island of Ireland and, and Great Britain. Mm. Both of those borders will be equally as damaging, not just to trade, but to, to communities as well. Borders, unfortunately, bring a series of problems. Uh, they separate communities, they separate economies, they separate uh, families in many respects uh, right across the, uh, this island, essentially. Yeah. Uh, and, and anything that will 
put a barrier in the way to that free movement of people, that free movement of trade, the free movement of tourists and others has actually massive damaging implications politically so Stephen, and economically. What do you want? Nothing. Just leave it as it is. That there, was all, there's, there was a travel arrangement between Northern Ireland and Ireland long before uh, the European Union. So just leave it as it is? Is that possible? Well, Boris Johnson wants his cake and he wants to eat it as well. I mean, the, the, the reality Boris is Johnson that is the Foreign the, Minister of the United Kingdom. The, the reality is that the, the UK government seem to be wanting to negotiate yeah. uh, a deal which results in exactly what we have at the moment without having to pay for the contributions towards the EU and they have more control over immigration. Now, I think realists uh, understand that that's probably not probable uh, and certainly uh, it's going to be massively difficult for them to try to achieve that. But for us, that all island economy is a very positive thing, whether yeah. it's people moving and what transferring are businesses, big jobs. I, I know businesses are doing, they're, they're kind of planning for there being not a plan right now um, and they're working out when Brexit happens uh, and we've, we, we're wanting to trade between Northern Ireland and Ireland. What are they doing, Stephen? Well, they're not just planning. Some businesses are actually taking action. Mm. So last week in the, in the House of Commons in the UK Parliament, uh, one of our largest employers, a pharmaceutical firm, uh, announced that they'd actually decided to open up a new facility in the Republic of Ireland. They did that because on the day after the referendum vote, their customers asked them, what's your Brexit plan? Within two weeks, they formulated what that plan was, and that plan was to ensure that they had a presence in the European Union. So they just moved, and they're moving some investment just slightly down the road yeah. into Dundalk in the Republic of Ireland. And with it, our jobs. And they've warned that if there's any return to customs posts, any of those non-tariff barriers, so it's not just about adding additional costs in terms, in terms of tariffs, but all the administration that comes with it, that if that happens, they may need to switch and, and swap jobs from Northern mm -hmm. Ireland to the Republic of Ireland. Why? Because their customers have told them this is essential. So Stephen, I'm, I'm glad you're talking about businesses no, because I, I, want, I want to share this tweet I, we got I, from Harvey. Uh, Harvey says, businesses in Northern Ireland depend on people from the Republic. And if there are custom checks, people just won't go. Another person mentions farmland. This is Joe who says, the whole idea of going back to checkpoints is chilling. Plus, we're talking a significant distance, <coughs> a lot of which is farmland. So what will they do? Build a wall? And they say they're being facetious there uh, but Sophie I want to get you in here what do you make of that um, what I'd say is yeah th th those points are absolutely valid practically it appears to be impossible but what we have to remember is um, the UK government don't want a hard, hard border and the Irish government said they don't want a hard border the EU themselves don't want a hard border um, the difficulty of it is that the two major parties in the Northern Ireland Assembly as Pierce pointed out are diametrically opposed on this and you have this kind of awful political discourse when the decision has been made one side says, suck it up and take it, and the other side is trying to, to put their concerns forward. Uh, the concerns should be taken seriously, as I said, but um, the Republic and the UK are co-signatories to the Good Friday Agreement, right? Um, if any of this, if the implementation of a border, this kind of uncertainty, is a threat to the stability engendered by the Good Friday Agreement, Sophie, this, whole, two governments this whole conversation has been about uncertainty. I want to bring in uh, the uh, British Prime Minister and also the Irish Prime Minister to see what they had to say recently about this what is the plan? Have a look. This is what we are working on, that we need to find a solution which enables us to have that as seamless and frictionless a border as possible uh, between Northern Ireland and Ireland so that we can continue to see the trade, the everyday movements um, that we have seen up to now. And of course, we also want to ensure that we carry on with the common travel area, which uh, was in existence long before either of us were members of uh, uh, the European Union or its predecessors. We're going to carry on this conversation. I'm going to take it online. It's a big conversation. We're talking about history and uncertain future as well. We've got Stephen and Sophie and Pierce and Colin and you, hopefully. This is what you have to do. If you're watching right now on TV, get online. If you're online, you need to be at a special website. I know we're very needy. Stream.aljazeera.com is the place to go. And then you can continue this conversation with Stephen, Sophie, Pierce and Colin about what is going to happen between Northern Ireland and Ireland when Brexit happens and also the upcoming assembly elections which happen on Thursday. Thank you so much for being part of our programme. For now, we will see you online, hopefully. Take care, everybody.
Hello there, welcome to our online post show. We've been having a really meaty conversation with our guests. I want to talk about the assembly elections literally hours away. I, I want to show you an ad. It's from the Democratic Unionist Party. And then we're going to talk about the campaign. How's it going? What might be the results? Have a look at the ad. This election is important. Your vote will determine whether Northern Ireland goes forward or back. How we treat the past is really about what we tell the next generation. We will stand up for our soldiers and the security forces who defended us. And we must teach our children that terrorism was never justified. The result of the DUP not having the most seats will be that Gerry Adams will be in a position to push his Republican agenda for a border poll to undermine the union and to rewrite the past. That's why I'm asking you, on Thursday, vote DUP. Mm, scare tactics? <laughs> Goodness me, what is going on here? Malika, what do you have? So that's DUP on the one hand. On the other hand, take a look at Twitter. This is Sean Fein. Uh, Pat Sheehan uh, stopped at a customs checkpoint on Anderson Town Road today at the Brexit Day of Action. So this is a picture from not too long ago at one of those mock checkpoints. And this is what people online thought about it. Uh, Dare Barron says, this is a grandstanding stunt with underlying threat to a return of the violent past. Another person, though, doesn't just blame Sinn Féin. This is Richard, who says some parties on both sides are using Brexit to stir up tensions, but voters are aware of this bad decision. So, Pierce, of course, I'm going to go to you with that. This person says it's fear-mongering. Not, not at all. And anybody who was there, and that was on Anderson's town, well, there's communities right across the um, border, corridor, uh, which are carrying out those days of actions, and you showed a clip of it earlier on. Uh, what it's about is actually letting people know that this nonsense about frictionless borders or no return to the borders of the past means nothing. If Britain is withdrawing from the customs union, if they're withdrawing from the single market, then there will be some type of border and uh, 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 there will be some type of checks. Now, uh, we're not suggesting that that will be British Army or whatever, but it, well, there will be some type of customs check. If there is no common travel agreement, we will be stopped at, for example, me traveling to the Irish Parliament, I have to go through the North. I travel through the North every every day when I tra travel to the Irish Parliament. You will have to show some form of identification unless there is a free travel uh, agreement between ourselves and Britain. But even if the Irish government, which is their stated position, and the British government want no return to the hard borders, as they, as they call it, it's not in their gift. It's the European Union which will decide where the custom border is uh, with the, the, the territory of, of Britain and, and, and the United Kingdom. So it's, it's not within the Irish government and the British government's gift. And what we're doing is just confirming what the Irish government are already doing. The contingency plans are in place. The revenue, which is the authorities in the, in, in the Irish Republic, are identifying locations where these checkpoints will take place. And part of this is about this election campaign mm. that, you know, we talked about the good but Friday agreement. this election process. campaign, after this election yeah. campaign, it's what happens next that becomes the most important issue. Because with the DUP and Sinn Féin finding it very difficult to coexist in the Northern Ireland executive at the moment, to establish a platform of government when Brexit is the most important issue affecting Northern Ireland, but they're diametrically opposed on this issue. And it actually undermines an awful lot of what they're doing with an agenda towards lowering corporation tax. If Northern Ireland isn't in the EU single market, then that won't yield competitive advantages that the executive thought it would relative to the Republic of Ireland. The issue is, if there is no agreement between those parties, and none seems likely at the moment, well then we're entering an era where there's no voice for Northern Ireland, there's potentially a return to direct rule. And the worst thing well, the for all, that scenario for the people of, all, of Northern Ireland yeah. is that their elected representatives don't put their voice in the joint ministerial committee, which is where each of the three devolved regions and nations of the United Kingdom feed through their concerns to the Brexit debate. If Sinn Féin and the DUP can't work together in that, and already Wales and Scotland have their action plans for Brexit published, but Northern Ireland doesn't because of this diametric opposition between the two main parties, well then it's going to be disastrous for the people of Northern Ireland and indeed for 
many people in the Republic of Ireland. Sophie? Well, first of all, ministers... ministers it will, absolutely. And the thing is, Northern Ireland has always sort of uh, seen itself as special and a place apart. And to a large extent, the UK government has been forced to treat us like that because it has been so unstable here. Um, but now that we've had around 20 years of, you know, a relative level of peace, there's still unacceptable levels of violence. Um, the UK government has uh, other things on its plate. We're not really a priority as much anymore. And, and I absolutely agree. We need some sort of strong, coherent voice fighting for the interests of Northern Ireland. And whilst these two parties are busy trying to frighten people about voting for somebody else other than them, we're not going to have that. Um, so we need to see some sign of political maturity because the impact of this could cause uh, damage to peace building funding here. It could cause damage to uh, human rights protections. And it could, as I said earlier, alienate the Irish nationalist community who the DUP are already doing their best to alienate, um, so we absolutely need political leadership. Let me just check in with, with Stephen before I wrap things up. Hold, hold tight a minute, Pierce. Uh, Stephen, do you have confidence in your politicians? <laughs> That's a very good question. Uh, I, I think we always have to travel and hope, I suppose, is the answer to that. Yeah. Uh, but regardless, uh, business isn't waiting. Business is actually taking action themselves. Uh, we're engaged with the, the Irish government in terms of its all-island Brexit dialogue. We're engaging with politicians in Westminster, including the Secretary of State and the committees there at the House of Commons. And we're going to go to Brussels as well. Mm. Uh, <clears throat> Sophie said there, Northern Ireland is a, a kind of special place. And when it comes to this particular problem, this is high up the agenda for the European Union itself. Uh, so if we have one side of the table certainly uh, very focused on it, we need to make sure the UK government is equally focused on it. And that puts us in a very good place where we can actually have both sides of the negotiation actually interested in our needs and our demands. Mm -hmm. Now, we need to make sure we're clear about what those needs and demands are. Uh, and that's where they, uh, the business community is trying to take some sort of leadership and reach forward and, and, and create uh, that list of uh, what we want to see happen so that the Irish government, the negotiators in the EU and the British government are able to, to deliver what we require. This feels like, a, I'm not an academic, Colin, so forgive my use of phrase here. This feels like a hot mess. The whole no return to the borders of the past catchphrase that Theresa May as the UK Prime Minister keeps throwing out doesn't really get to the nub of the problem. Mm. We're not talking about an immediate turn to securitization or, as Pierce said, soldiers manning those border posts. But like Stephen just said, we're talking about real disruption for businesses, for travellers, for tourists coming between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland. And we're talking about a scenario where, yeah, a hot mess might well sum it up, where there well, isn't an immediate solution to these issues on the table. Well, there can be a solution. And, and none of us can guarantee that that solution will be the accepted one. But Sinn Féin has put forward a plan. And I don't agree with what Sophie is saying about us trying to find people not to vote for the DUP or other political parties. We stand on this election campaign on the basis of respect, integrity and delivering for all people. Uh, it's actually, and I think Sophie knows this, is DUP have taken a very negative campaign on this. But look, Sinn Féin is, is clear. The principles of consent is the most probably important principle that underfines the peace process and the Good Friday Agreement. The consent of the people in the, in the north of Ireland, which is 56% want to it's something that we want. That is why we passed a resolution uh, which was supported by the Parliament that would put this as the negotiating position of the Irish government to secure special status for the North within the European Union. Yes. That is why our leader in the North, Michelle O'Neill, has reached out to every single leader across yes, the I'm European thank Union you now looking for your, support for that argument. Internet that is why connection we're with Theresa May. is waning. So when, your internet, when your internet connection is waning, that is the internet gods telling us we need to wrap up the show. Piers and Colin and Sophie and Stephen, we couldn't do all in one show, but I appreciate you trying. Malika, where do you want to leave us? I'll leave us with two tweets. One, because we had to wrap you up there, Pierce. This is a tweet from Kev who says, as someone who remembers the worst of the troubles, refreshingly unusual to wholeheartedly agree with someone from Sinn Féin. I don't know if that's a compliment or not. Uh, but for all of our guests, this is from Dearman, who says, excellent debate about the implications for Ireland at Brexit and the impact of the Irish border. People and Dearman, are watching. Dearman is an Al Jazeera freelance editor, <laughs> ex-BBC, ex-RTE. RT and others in Ireland. So I think he had a dog in the race here. Thank you very much, everybody, for being with us today. And uh, we shall be following Northern Ireland and Ireland and seeing what happens after the elections with great interest. Take care, everybody. Appreciate your time. <laughs>